you. So as mentioned, I'm Gareth and I work uh, for the Wetlands and Floodplains team. And uh, today my presentation will be on the water bird response to the environmental watering of Toll Road Game Reserve. So where is it? It's located on the northern shore of Lake Alexandrina, 14 kilometres northeast of Malang, and a little over an hour's drive from Adelaide. The reserve is 200 hectares in size, which a portion is designated for hunting. Though I must stress that where we're doing the environmental watering does not overlap with this hunting zone. As you can probably tell, it doesn't look like your typical wetland around the lower lakes, but rather is a series of artificial bays, embayments and channels which are all pumped. So the pump shown in red receives water from Lake Alexandrina via a main supply channel shown here in blue, <coughs> with water then pumped into what is known as the swimming pool, which has a series of sluice gates around its outer rim and you can open and close these sluice gates to control water flow into the bays you're seeking to pump. So a little background, Tolder was purchased by the South Australian government in 1970 with the objective to conserve water bird populations. And it was managed with this objective in mind until 2008, uh, which time at the height of the millennium drought, the water license was uh, relinquished. This meant for over six years, the bays of Tolderol remained dry until the environmental watering program kicked off in 2014. So prior to 2008, Tolderol was considered one of the most ecologically diverse wetlands around the lower lakes and was a home to threatened fish and frog species. But the main draw card was its water bird life with 86 birds, uh, water bird species having been observed, of which 26 are marichi waders. So what is the marichi wader? Well, it's a shorebird which undergoes these epic migrations from their breeding grounds, typically in Siberia and Western Alaska, all the way down to Australia, where they'll spend their non-breeding season from spring to autumn. While in Australia, their main aim is to gain body condition, which they'll use as a fuel resource for their migration back north. Unfortunately, a lot of the species visiting have declining populations, none more so than the curly sandpiper, which has had a population decline of 80% in the past 30 years. So with this our objective, so our objective with the environmental watering is to reinstate Tolderol as an ecological and community asset, with the main ecological goal being to provide foraging habitat for Maitri Wader species. And tying in with this objective, our watering um, was over the marchery wader season, for, so from spring to autumn again. 2014-15, this was unfortunately cut short as low lake levels and excessive aquatic plant growth made it difficult to maintain uh, water flow to the pump. But prior to the 2015-16 season, we dredged the main supply channel, which has allowed us to water later into the season. So over the past two watering seasons, we've watered three bays, which totals 28 hectares. And two of these three bays were ploughed. Ploughing's been a long-held practice at Tolderol, um, and it was sort of cited to improve water bird use of these sites. But by keeping one of these bays unploughed, it allowed for a comparison in uh, water bird use, which I'll come to a bit later on. Unfortunately, there are a few watering limitations. So currently, Water delivery is sequential, which means that you're required to fill Bay 7 before Bay 6 can receive water, and likewise, you're required to fill Bay 6 before Bay 5 can receive water. This means that as the bays are drying out, you're required to pump water above the ideal foraging height for marchy wader species for each of the bays to receive water. So I had a number of monitoring questions that um, I wanted my bird surveys to answer. One was how well we've been able to restore the water bird community to what it was prior to the loss of the water license. And I was also interested to know how well we've been able to cater for threatened species and marichi waders. And of course, I wanted to know how water bird um, use differed between ploughed and unploughed bays. So data collection took on a number of different means. Um, I led monthly bird surveys with uh, community, uh, community and um, also encouraged them to do their own uh, survey. So a lot of the data I'm presenting also includes club and community surveys and any opportunistic sightings they had. So 
So over the past two watering seasons, we've had 59 wetland dependent bird species um, at Tolderol. This includes the critically endangered curlew sandpiper and the endangered Australasian bittern. We've had 16 migratory species, of which 13 are migratory waders. Unfortunately, a lot of the early data used number categories, and I must mention this comes from Birds SA, which is really great. Um, so I've also converted my e-water data into number categories. Unfortunately, this sort of undersells the number of water birds truly using the site. There's two main differences you can see. One is the number of piscivores, which are more prevalent during our e-water periods after 2014. Uh, this functional group is largely dominated by the whiskered tern, which was observed in their thousands shortly after pumping. But we've had fewer shorebirds um, occur during our e-water period in comparison to what was occurring prior to the bays being dry. It's we don't quite know why this is, as there's no detailed management log of how many bays and what area was covered by pumping. Uh, so yeah, we don't know whether it's water delivery or just yeah, area of pumping. So uh, ploughed and unploughed bays um, showed a few differences, um, namely shorebirds, uh, but also herbivores and dabbling ducks, uh, while there are no differences in the piscivore and large waders groups. It's worth mentioning again that the piscivores were dominated by the whiskered tern. And while there weren't any differences in the number of whiskered terns using ploughed and unploughed bays, there was a difference in behaviour with uh, the ploughed bays also supporting resting, whereas the unploughed bay, which also ha which had a cover of sandfire, did not support this um, activity. So why plough? Well, this study, along with number in Europe and the US shows that it supports more shorebirds, in particular migratory waders. Um, and this is a function of greater fu uh, food resources as well as by ploughing the vegetation which covered the bays previous, it allows for a clear vision of predators as well as unimpeded foraging. As this graph shows, migratory wader numbers are highly variable. So on the 24th of January 2015, there are over 3,000 at the site. But just two days later, on the 26th, there was just a mere 75. This variability is due to a number of different causes, one of which could be lake level, so whether there's richer foraging habitats which are present close by, um, which might have recently become exposed. Uh, primary productivity, so with our pumping, there's an initial boom of primary productivity, but over the course of a watering season, it slowly declines. Water level of bays, as mentioned before, might not be suitable for migratory wader foraging. And the extent of Bulbachinus coldwellii. This one here. So as you can tell, there's a large change that occurs over the course of watering season, with uh, Bulbachinus covering vast tracts of each watered bay. Although you can't tell in this image that there's, there is still shallow water and uh, mudflat available in the bottom image here. So this changes the bird community quite somewhat. It reduces the available habitat in which migratory waders can forage in as the dense bulbachinus doesn't allow for them to have unimpeded foraging and clear vision of predators. However, it does provide habitat for your cryptic bird species, so your spotless crake, your latham snipe, uh, perfect swamp hen and Australasian bittern. So the Australasian bin is nationally listed as endangered, and we've been fortunate enough to have sightings of this species in January, February, and March of this year. Uh, one of the reasons they might be around is because they have a preference of Bulbachinus over reed species, but also there's likely an abundant food resource at Calderol with the environmental watering helping promote a longer uh, frog breeding season. Uh, prior to the drought, uh, Tolderol is a key wetland for this species, so it's nice to see that we've gone quite some way in restoring um, this site for an endangered species. So future development. Next watering season, we're going to double our area. So with bays 17 and 4, as uh, an additional 29 hectares. And with this, we're also going to improve water delivery. So we'll have independent water delivery to the bays, which will mean that we can keep 
water at a height suitable for migratory wader foraging over the course of a watering season. So in summary, we've helped to go a long way to restore the ecological value of Toldoral. With 58 wetland dependent bird species have been observed, of which 12 are migratory waders. And we've also been able to cater for threatened species. And next year, things will be bigger and better, and we should be able to support uh, migratory waders over the whole course of a watering season in larger abundances. So I'd just like to acknowledge all the partners that are involved in this project. Um, so the NRM board, um, NLP for funding, uh, Google Wellington Lab for their ongoing support, Birds SA for their members coming out, providing data and their financial contribution, and Chassa for their financial contribution also and support. <coughs>